So Barry, I think the, the question is, um, other than what we know the shelter grant will allow for, which is pretty much any type of safe, insane, well-run shelter, um, I think it would be nice to hear from the committee in terms of what kinds of things we should look for. Yeah, I think so too. I think let's, let's open that up for discussion. Um, anybody uh, have ideas, Marcus? Yeah, I'll be glad to. Thank you all for uh, having me back again this year uh, to do what I can, and I'll do my very best in this in this role as homeless advocate in Whatcom County. Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> I think that it's really important uh, for the unified command uh, to recognize that we still have many hundreds of unsheltered people in Bellingham and in Whatcom County, and we need to try to provide for them as quickly as possible. Um, the clean the camp cleanups in Bellingham do continue. Uh, I recently had a meeting. Uh, I, I, I want you, the group to know that I've, I have been out on two different observations in the last month. And, um, and some of the stuff I found was there was there were some some failures in communication in the BPD or whatever to the officers on the ground. So not everybody knew what was going on. And I've handed down my recommendations on some changes there. But regardless, we are moving people around in our city instead of letting them shelter in place and trying to provide for them. And so what we probably need to do, as far as I'm concerned, is to immediately uh, build some tent encampments, identify some properties between the county and the city, um, maybe purchase something between the two of them through unified command, through CARES dollars, uh, get a tent encampment up immediately, very similar to the winter haven or safe haven uh, encampments that you've seen homes now do. And uh, with the promise of transitioning uh, toward other sheltering, now, that can easily transition to tiny homes on the same lot where you do the, the tent encampments. And we discussed ad nauseum uh, the, uh, the benefits and the uh, financial benefits and, and the social benefits of that, as well as uh, the, the safety of isolation in your own little building uh, during a pandemic, any pandemic. So I'm really going to uh, ask for the city, county, and unified command to start identifying and providing these uh, tent encampment sites, and we'll help. Uh, and when I say we, I'm and now I'm putting on my hat as a uh, as a Holmes now uh, co-chair, or uh, I should say vice chair. Very important that we that we stabilize this community. They are being moved around our city for whatever reasons. And that's, that's there's some argument about uh, whether they should be moved or not moved. And we're not done having that discussion and it's a worthwhile discussion, I assure you. Um, but we need to, we have winter just around the corner and we can take advantage of, of this opportunity to build tent encampments, <laughs> not more than 20 people with services available in a fenced in area that allows us to control whether there's bike chop shops or any other activities in there, we can control that and we can provide services to those locations with the promise of providing other shelter by winter, which of course this group is also charged with. I appreciate your time and I would love to hear more input on that. Council Member Lilliquist. Well, if I understand it, um, this money is only available if it's a, a permanent, you know, 365 a year. This is not, I thought the beds had to be available year round they, they do have to be available year round. They don't have to be permanent structures. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean permanent that yeah. sense. So I, I don't, so if we had a permanent tent encampment, permanent, sorry, a long-term tent encampment that would qualify. So yeah. the city has already uh, put out a call, I, over $200,000 we, we offered as a, um, support if anybody wanted to run a safe parking facility. Um, we've got money, city, we needed a partner, we needed a location. It seems to me we're in a very similar situation. We have another source of money, approximately the same amount of money to help with um, programming, facilities, sanitation, maybe some staffing. We still need a location and partners. And so I think kind of that needs to be the focus. Oddly enough, we've got a strange situation where we have money which is usually the hard part. Now we have a fair chunk of change. I think it's gonna be chasing the same group of people, the same entities that might wanna step up as safe parking, might be the same entities that we would be inviting with this new source of funding. And I'm wondering if location isn't actually the hardest nut to crack. That if we had money and a the location, then maybe we could you know, 
find the community partners, um, hire some uh, staff to oversee, oversee volunteers. I don't know. It seems to me that we're so close and location, I think, is maybe the key issue. That's a good point, Michael. I had a question on that for Rick, probably. I just was curious, what's the status of the Unity Village move uh, from Post Point out to Clean and Green? And uh, what's going on with that Clean and Green property? And what's the next steps there, Rick? So we modified the permit when COVID became um, more pronounced because um, fundamentally it's unsafe to bring large groups of people together to try to relocate that camp. And uh, we've stopped the clock on tolling the permit um, so that they can remain in place at Fairhaven for the duration of this event, um, because that's the safest place for the folks that are there. The application for uh, Clean Glean was withdrawn um, at the time. Um, and the reason for that largely was it was a, um, you know, Michael talks about the challenges of finding location. He's exactly right. Um, that site was uh, contested by a number of people who had significant concerns. By withdrawing the application, we stayed challenged on some of the processes associated with that. Um, so uh, there's no pending application for Clean Green. Um, Unity Village is uh, permitted by an extension due to the emergency to stay uh, term unlimited at this point till we get better handle in our arms around the COVID uh, crisis. Great, thanks Rick. Emily, I think I saw your hand up. Yeah, and forgive me if this is not um, helpful, but I guess I'm wondering about the broader context um, and I, I, this is two days in a row, I've heard you with that list and, and it's still hard to digest. So I'm looking forward to seeing it in writing, but, um, but the incoming sources are only half the puzzle. The other is I'm curious about what we're gonna need to cut. And, and, and I guess I'm just wondering about um, that, that maybe that other half of the puzzle might help us when we talk about strategy for how to spend some of those incoming dollars is sort of knowing what the consequences are going to be of some of the reductions and whether or not there's uh, um, any anything we need to think about protecting or enhancing with the incoming revenue from some loss on the other side so i don't i just curious whether you have any sense of um some some sort of something we should be thinking strategically about that has to do with the loss not just the increase so Emily's referring to a conversation we had with some of our housing. All this money coming in is good news, um, but there's bad news as well. Uh, we know that the COVID pandemic has really challenged our economy. For the county in particular, we collect one tenth of 1% of the sales tax and dedicate it to behavioral health services. We bring in almost 5 million a year and over a fourth of that, over uh, actually over a million dollars a year of those funds are dedicated to housing supports, recovery supports for people with behavioral health disorders. We're experiencing right now about a 24% decrease in sales tax. So again, that's about a million dollars. We're short as we are starting our budget process for the next two years, 2021, 2022. And so what we've been looking at right now is how to reduce our expenditures from that fund to the uh, tune of about $700,000. Some of that is going to be housing programs that we aren't gonna be able to support anymore, or at least housing services. So um, Emily, in response to your question, um, the short answer is I, I haven't a clue. I don't have the answer because it's so, <laughs> there are so many moving parts. And like I said, we just had word last week of new funding, right? So for us, the challenge is this. A lot of the new funding we're getting is very focused, very restricted doesn't necessarily help us in terms of the losses we're going to experience. It also, some of it, as we noted, is directly related to COVID, where obviously our long-term strategic planning and funding is not. 
And then finally, some of these that we could use to help offset the costs of losing, uh, of losing some of this revenue from the behavioral health sales tax, we could use other funding to support those programs. It's just that the funder will not allow us to do so. And that's because it's, they don't want us to fill in a loss of revenue with these funds. So I think what we're looking at, um, I believe we'll still have rent assistance for the most part. I think what we are really going to struggle with is how we support housing case management. And that's critical for people who um, have challenges securing housing or have barriers to housing. Our housing case managers have been instrumental in getting people um, help to get their records, uh, their tenant records cleaned up, their um, applications appropriately submitted, finding the right housing source for their needs, et cetera. Housing case management has just been an integral part of our system. And I believe that's where we're going to experience some challenges. So when it comes to shelter and some of these shelter grants we're receiving, for us, again, we know that part of the requirement of the funding is that the people who operate these must be able to help people exit these temporary shelters and move toward permanent housing. So again, they're going to, we're gonna to have to find partners besides just finding a location, we'll need to find partners who have those skill sets and can really move people into permanent housing. That wasn't a complete answer, but it's what I know. Okay, I think Dean, you were next, then Marcus. Yeah, I a um, couple of things. One is just to, to key off of uh, Ann's comments about uh, case, case management support. Um, you know, it's not just for uh, helping folks get into housing, but for those folks, um, because we follow a housing first model, first get them under a roof and then, you know, work with folks on those other many issues around behavioral health, housing, uh, case management, while they have now been living in uh, permanent supported housing is, is critical. And, you know, we have uh, facilities in this uh, city that, uh, you know, we've jumped into doing that kind of work at 22 North, for example, uh, where in, in our case, the focus we have as an organization in Northwest Youth Services is those young adults um, just transitioning out of uh, uh, adolescence um, and on the street. Um, and in terms of the shelter uh, issue, uh, you know, and I've heard you mention a couple of times, those are, there are some specialty dollars I just want to share some anecdotes. Um, we have uh, young adults uh, who have been significant, significant support people to other young adults that get who get moved into permanent supported housing. But these are efficiencies. The person who moves into the housing, their significant other is on the street still. The guest policies for uh, them being able to have youth come in and be with them, spend time with them, particularly when they have behavioral health issues, are pretty restrictive. And so as a result, we have young adults who are camping out on the street. They don't feel safe um, using particularly the uh, general adult shelter kinds of opportunities. Um, and uh, they are generating uh, issues for businesses uh, around uh, the community because they, they're camping where they feel most safe or so there are other programs around them. And so I just really think um, you know, paying attention to specialty year round shelters for young adults is one of the critical needs. Um, you know, right now, uh, the city and the county are both funding uh, our ground floor uh, drop in center. That's a location youth often or young adults feel safe um, hanging out in, but that's not 24 7. It's not a shelter. We had the youth, the winter shelter last uh, winter that we operated. But those youth who um, use those services are still out there, still uh, trying to find a safe place to camp in a tent where they're not uh, potentially victimized. And so I just think a focus on uh, specialty shelter for young adults is going to be key. Okay, thanks, Dean. Marcus? 
Yeah, thank you, Barry. Um, so we at Homes Now, what, what, one thing that we do is that we don't take government dollars directly. Now we do have a lease on, uh, on, on city property and we've had two different leases on other uh, city properties, which are available for doing this sort of sheltering, by the way. So that's something we could look at, I think. Also the clean green site, uh, as noted, is available out there. But what, you know, and, and, and why we don't take government dollars, one of the big reasons for it is that it rather indemnifies us of uh, the public, um, condemning us for taking the tax dollars. There's my tax dollars at work and all that. We get to say, no, no, this is actually uh, your citizens that have done this this, and that they believe in this. And so they're your, they're your neighbors. And, and that's important and it's important to us. And that's why we don't directly take government dollars, but we will take materials. We will take land if offered um, or a lease on land. And it is in that spirit, and there may be others out there who, have sim who are similarly constrained uh, but I would like to present to make it easier for partners because everything still seems to be we need partners, partners, partners before we can start on, a, on be that a, an encampment, be that a, a parking program, whatever that is. So to help attract partners, let's look at the possibility of taking some funds and identifying sites and providing uh, the services that are needed for these operations. You're going to need water. You're going to need electricity. You're going to need a hookup for septic. Um, ideally, and you can haul your own gray water like we do, and you can have toilets like we do. But as Mr. Seppler has said all along, those those are baby steps for us, and we're just still trying to get to our original proposal. The deal is, if we can have a site where any partner could apply to provide their services on that site without having to lay down the expense of electricity, or you know, for instance, the county was the first entity that allowed us to have a lease on a property clear out on Northwest. It was still, the, it was the best that we could come up with. And we were really thankful to have them as partners in that. The cost came to somewhere around $65,000 for us to do an electrical drop to where we were. Um, that became very prohibitive, largely because we only have a two year limit on our, uh, on our leases on these properties or our, on the permits. I'm also going to ask, and I'm glad to ask that in front of this esteemed group that has both city and county councils, et cetera, that we're gonna try to push for a, uh, a five-year limit on, on that type of use. And we're hoping that, that you uh, will move forward on that so we don't have to, because we're all very busy, but uh, uh, know that that's coming. We're gonna ask for it, so I'm asking for it. And, and so a five-year limit on these permits instead of two-year might have enticed us to spend more money on electrification or other uh, other uses for, you know. So again, I'd just like to say that if we can identify some properties and bring those services to those properties, they would be much more attractive to uh, perhaps smaller groups that just don't. And they can just walk in, plug in, even under the two year and get this done. Uh, so I mean, I, I'm really going to push for that, and I'm asking for that now. So I just want you all to consider. Okay. Any other suggestions that we could uh, come up with, at least for now? Michael. Again, I'm going to go back to a theme I've been sounding for a while that um, there are certain um, populations of homeless people who aren't well served in a general purpose drop-in center. Um, elderly, handicapped, medically fragile, and also people with particular family situations. So um, I, I would look to enhance that. Um, um, Ms. Deacon, you mentioned that there already was some small monies for special needs people. I can't, I can't remember, was that mostly like motel type support? But anyway, it's a pop, it's, it's, a, it's a, a set of people that I think we should look to create a special shelter for and draw off some of the strain and some of the mismatches that we're getting right now in the current system. And if I could just say briefly, some of the specialty shelters that we currently support, obviously DV SAS um, is one. Uh, Interfaith Coalition has shelters for families only. We support those. Um, we support obviously the Youth Positive Adolescent Development Program, the PAD. So those are some of the specialty type shelters we support and their permanent locations. Yes, more of that, I think. Um, because I think what we want is a 
system that covers most of the bases. And I think there's a feeling that that's not occurring now. Um, those, those are my comments. So, so Barry, I, I would look for opportunities there with the funds we have. Thanks, Michael. I think those are great ideas. Anybody else have anything for on this subject? And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if Ann mentioned it or not, but the, these shelter dollars are going to be attached to the the coordinated entry system and the or in the the HMIS system. So these whoever is providing the services is going to need to be reporting into the HMIS system on a daily basis of shelter beds if they're doing like a shelter by night. So they have to be willing to be a part of that that reporting to the state. Yeah, Marcus. Thanks, Barry. Uh, just real briefly, too, I wanted to kind of correct the record from uh, the last meeting that we all had, and there was a, a member here in this group who uh, made a lot of misstatements about Homes Now and what we can and can't do and what services we provide. And I just want to clarify that of all of these specialty uh, groups that, that uh, we want to provide for, Homes Now has reached out and is providing shelter for many of those specialty groups, veterans, uh, 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 domestic abuse, uh, issues. We can't take families in uh, and we, we don't have the facilities to be able to do that very well anyway. And so we're not having kids in there and uh, but we but we're taking care of uh, uh, drug addiction, alcohol addiction issues. We have all kinds of we we have found that we we feel that if we mix up the population a little bit, it's more representative of those people you'll find when you leave the group to go into uh, regular housing and your, your, your neighbor in your apartment is going to be a veteran and the one over next door is going to be a domestic abuse survivor. And so uh, it's, it's good to see them all mix together and take care of each other. And, uh, and, and of course, that environment really allows for that. I just wanted to correct the record on that and not take any more time. I thank you all for everything. Okay, well, I think we need to probably move on. Uh, we're gonna come back to the upcoming meeting schedule. We'll do that at the end, uh, but can, I wanna get I to the- I see that Lisa Marks has her hand raised. Sorry to interrupt, um, but Lisa Marks has her hand raised. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah. Go ahead, Lisa. Thank you, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I, I mean, excuse me for, I, I'm new and so I'd like to get up to speed on some stuff, so I had a couple of questions. Um, have you guys worked with Lehigh in the past, low-income housing? We had Lehigh come up uh, to the county council, actually this group, and met with mm -hmm. us two years ago. Does that sound about right? Three years ago? Two or three years ago. <laughs> anyway, okay. they came up, uh, Sharon came up, and I did a tour of, of their facilities as well in Seattle. So mm -hmm. we haven't worked with them, but we have talked to them. Um, I've done a lot of work with Lehigh and they're really a great organization to work with and we've done a lot of awesome tiny house builds that have been, you know, specific for, uh, we did a, a really neat um, woman for woman build where we got a lot of women from the trades to come and build a whole facility that was nothing for nothing but, you know, chronically homeless women and, um, you know, done a lot of focus groups they've got a huge network and can really get a lot of volunteers together to come and do these builds they, we've also worked with a lot of the schools and worked with the schools to help them with their program so schools that have ct programs that are in construction they'll give the materials and everything to these schools but the schools build these tiny houses and then, um, you know, the schools are, are gaining because they're being able to teach the kids how to, how to build and, and work with the schools on these CTE programs. And then, you know, being able to have that, the tiny houses for the communities. We've also done some work with a lot of the trades, um, TVTC at, in Marysville, uh, the Toledo tribe out there. Um, we've done some work with them. So, um, I think there could be some opportunity there as well if you guys would like some contact information on some of those those folks. Yeah, that's that sounds great, Lisa. Yeah, Mr. Sepler. Yeah, um, really good organization. We've had ongoing uh, conversations with them now for several years. Um, you might recall that um, 
uh, Sharon came up and participated with Western Washington and the city in hosting a, a focused uh, discussion on temporary encampments. Um, much wisdom, they've run hundreds of units as, as uh, Lisa Marks noted. Um, they've got some pretty good ideas about operation. Um, they are not supportive at all about, um, about residents running their own encampments. They've had um, significant issues in Seattle with that, but they are very supportive about residents being engaged in building their own encampments. Um, I think the nuance is, is well taken. Um, they're always a resource for us and uh, they have offered to come up and help us um, should we have a specific proposal they want to advance. Okay. All right. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk a little bit about uh, the update on the Byron Avenue quarantine facility. So um, I can't really speak on B. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I can't speak um, specifically on behalf of the mission, but I'll tell you what I know. The um, isolation and quarantine facility has um, been used by probably around 70 people and families so far. We have been very fortunate to experience next to no COVID major outbreaks among the population that's been using our drop-in center, that's remarkable and um, we are very grateful. As you know, the concern for our community early on was that if an outbreak began there in close congregate quarters, that it would overwhelm our healthcare system and obviously um, be very uh, challenging in terms of controlling the spread of transmission to our whole community. So um, we have CMAR as a contracted entity that oversees the administration of the isolation and quarantine facility. And we have Lighthouse Mission staff that have provided some of the 24 seven support services, helping people check in, making sure they get their meals, um, making sure that um, special concerns are met and needs addressed. We have um, extended the lease right now through November. And I think we're playing it by ear in terms of how long we will need that facility. We have also noticed that the greatest use of this facility is by people who live in close quarters with others who cannot uh, find a way to isolate or quarantine themselves. Uh, our farm worker families, for instance, this has um, been a great program for them if they've got multiple people living in the same house. And um, we've been really clear to set up a lot of policies and procedures that we can pick up and use anytime in the future, depending on if we have to do this again, but also in case we have um, to continue this over time. Are there questions about this? It's, um, it's a great partnership between the uh, health department and CMAR, the Lighthouse Mission, and obviously the hospital. Hey, thanks, Ann. Yeah, Michael. Um. So the number of, of residents that facility has gone up and down, what is it averaging and what is our total capacity? The total capacity, um, well, there are 58 possible rooms, but some of them have double beds or I mean two beds. So um, I don't think I know there's, I don't know exactly what the total is. Uh, we never use all of them at any given time. Right now we have uh, somewhere between 10 and 13 people there. And it is, uh, I don't know if I gave you an average number, if that would be helpful. Sometimes we go down to one person. Sometimes we've been up over 25. So it's really, really broad. Other questions for about the uh, quarantine and isolation? Mr. Brown, welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've been listening to the proceedings. It's uh, uh, 
clearly a very dedicated group. And I, I saw a report out of, I think it was Boston, that one of the large shelters there, they, they tested everybody who was all, they were all asymptomatic, but 40% of them tested positive. Is it, when you say we've had no outbreaks here, we've had no, te we, we've had no visible outbreaks or we've had no symptomatic outbreak? Both. And I say that because we assume that even if there are asymptomatic people, but there's a large number of them, not everyone who contracts COVID is going to be asymptomatic. And we believe we would have seen much more illness in the facility than we would have. So we believe that actually the um, prevalence of COVID in that uh, current drop-in center has been incredibly low. There have been some people who have been symptomatic that we have taken into the isolation and quarantine facility for safety and oversight reasons to make sure they are uh, kept well, uh, but they tested negative. They had another upper respiratory condition. So, I mean, just, I mean, it seems like unusually good fortune. Have we got any explanation for that? No, we don't understand it either. And we decided to just count our blessings. All right, I went. I went jinx it. <laughs> I do. I do remember that was the first thing that we worked on when we, uh, when we had that early policy group. You and I and several others that met over in the health department basement, and that was the first subject we took on was was how do we protect that vulnerable population? So, right, knowing that, you know, if you have that many people. Um, who are ill, not only is our health system compromised, but then they're out in the community and then it just goes like wildfire. So we have just been incredibly fortunate. And again, I don't have an explanation for it. Maybe we need that group to start doing lessons at weddings and <laughs> social gatherings. <laughs> have <a good> problem. <laughs> yeah, right. Any other questions about the, uh, the quarantine facilities? Okay, we'll move on to the uh, drop-in center move, and that's uh, Mr. Seppler. Sure. Um, well, um, as we speak, um, the uh, the last service of food at the Bellingham High School site is incurring, and the residents and guests will move to the new location this afternoon. Um, the site's generally prepared. Uh, there'll be some temporary use, for example, of showers from the shower van till the showers are finished. And it will take um, a month or two to get all of the other uh, accoutrements that are needed to operate fully in place and implement uh, a lot of the uses that are intended. I think folks are generally aware it's a 200 person at capacity uh, facility um, and provides a broad range of services. Um, it's moving because the Bellingham High School was an interim step. That was a location that was identified due to a uh, uh, immediate need uh, to provide separation. Um, I know that there'll be some who will assert that it wasn't adequate in size um, and show photos that folks were close together. But there was a lot of devices and, and approaches that were used at that location, um, head toe, sleeping, with separation. And it was done in consultation with the health department. Um, and the proofs in the, the outcome, um, as Anne noted, um, fortunately, I uh, haven't seen the uh, prevalence of, of a, a super event at that location, which could potentially have occurred at the drop-in center's original location on Holly. Um, the, uh, the use, as noted, is funded both by the city and county through dollars that have been forwarded on and also, also through the housing levy. And the duration its current site will be for three years under the current funding, plus an additional year should the the mission wish to continue at the location. Um, this is a COVID emergency shelter at this point. It's under the emergency order of both the governor and the mayor to establish it. And we are uh, in the process of establishing a uh, permit for that. We're in the review process and anticipate issuing one in the next couple of weeks. Some might say, why are we doing the permit now? Um, and the reason is, is that the emergency only lasts as long as the COVID emergency. 
Um, we're all hoping it's going to be the shorter duration rather than the longer duration. But the minute that emergency ended, the site is and use would not be legal consistent with our codes. We also took the opportunity to use the process associated with the temporary encampment in an existing building to um, get community comments and be able to come up with the best suite of conditions to ensure um, that um, any potential impacts are greatly reduced in the surrounding area itself. Um, I should note that um, in the uh, move from the drop-in center in Holly to the Bellingham High School, um, that was of great urgency and no conditions were established. Um, so we are uh, uh, benefiting by having a little more time and able to implement immediately a number of things that will ensure it'll be more compatible with the general area itself. So should be in operation this evening um, with guests in sight. And uh, if you have not been there, I'm sure in the coming weeks, it would be a great opportunity to go see the facility and to uh, observe its operation. Happy to answer any questions about the uh, current process or the review process um, that's ongoing. Thanks, Rick. Any questions? Marcus. Yeah, uh, Rick, can you clarify? I, maybe I misheard, I just wasn't sure. So. Uh, Again, the, the 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 shelter that we're using at the public market space um, is 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 only legal there while we're under emergency. Or did I hear that wrong? So um, it's uh, because of the proclamation for both the governor and uh, the mayor uh, under emergency authority. It's established. That's why it was so quick. However, when that emergency ends, no one's certain on that date. Um, likely, a uh, broadly distributed vaccine would and that emergency, um, it wouldn't be consistent with our rules. So we took advantage of the opportunity of getting the permit that would come into play um, and allows uh, community members to, to weigh in on their concerns and ensure we get the best suite of, of uh, conditions uh, to ensure uh, the best operation of the site. So yeah, it's legal now because of the emergency. If the emergency ended, it wouldn't, but the permit would then take over. So we're just doing our homework right now. Great, thanks, Rick. That makes sense. Other questions? Mr. Brown. Uh, th there had been some discussion about putting portable buildings around the perimeter to sort of create, sort of create a, like a courtyard area where, and those portables might be used for providing other health-related services. Has, that been, has there been any further discussion on that? Um, not part of the initial plan or part of the permit, um, but I don't know if there's been additional discussion on that. Um, I know at this point, uh, the facility is um, as, you know, in a lot of ways, we looked for a facility for a number of years that had the characteristics of this site. Um, could there be additions? Absolutely. Could there be modifications over time? We'd incorporate them to a review process, but I'm not aware of any um, pending action to incorporate additional modulars on the site. Yeah, I think the, the, the purpose was as much to provide, you know, uh, social distanced capacity services by providing some more space, but also to provide sort of a visual buffer for the benefit of both the, the residents and um, the, the residents of the facility and also the, the general population just to create a bit of separation. Yeah, and if you drive by, we're uh, in the process of installing some landscaping around the fencing that went up. The fencing has been designed to provide some re visual relief. I know that the Lighthouse Mission is exploring wraps, colorful wraps that would be more decorative. There is some care being put into it. Um, however, um, folks in the courtyard have not committed a crime. It's not a crime to be homeless. Right, right, right. It's not a prison yard. So, it, you know, folks are going to have a view. Um, if you stand on the second floor, you'll look into the yard. Nonetheless, um, any use we'd want to mitigate as best we can. No, and I don't want to. I don't want to suggest that they have committed a crime, but there's, there's certainly a lot of those members that, that carry with them a self awareness of their circumstance, and they don't want to be seen by the people they went to high school with, for example. And so they they want a bit of privacy. Often, that's what it's been. You know what my understanding is. The, um, the other thing too is, is in, in the actual courtyard or what the parking lot area itself, is there going to be sort of like um, anywhere for them to sit and 
and and find sort of a, um, uh, find a reason to stay there because it's more comfortable for them as opposed to wandering around and, and entering the businesses locally that are concerned about the impact. Um, within the courtyard, there, there are seating that's available, picnic tables. There are um, some recreational amenities, um, some planters, um, and there are uses that will call, help folks stay there when you have the washers and dryers up, uh, laundry facilities and showers and restrooms could do it. Um, again, um, the encouragement is to come and take advantage of the services that are offered uh, to, to use the Seymour Health um, Center to, to uh, meet with their uh, uh, case managers if they have case managers or, or uh, address uh, information leads. Um, it, is a, it is a way station on the road to housing. Um, it is not a destination itself. And I think the courtyard itself is um, world's better um, our Holly Street location, the Holly Street location uh, was plagued by not having that kind of outdoor area that was controlled, um, that folks could be safe being in, that's monitored um, from, from other issues. And uh, this does provide that kind of safety. Um, there are a number of folks who won't be sleeping at the facility who a number of guests will use it for some of the services during the day and perhaps get the confidence enough to engage in the, the services that are offered. And I'll try to keep this to my last question. Has there been any consideration or plan for providing some sort of safe storage for belongings so people don't have to wander around with this stuff all the time? Yeah, I believe there's a basic uh, storage area that's there. I think, uh, and again, I'm not certain on this, but I believe it uh, has a capacity to become a hot room. Um, and that's uh, uh, for, for those who are aware, you, you make a hot room to sort of deal with some of the bed bug type of issues that get into clothing and you turn the heat up and it allows the storage and it, it disinfects in a way at that time. Right. I mean, a person, a person can't go to a job if they're carrying right. all their belongings with them, so they need somewhere safe to keep them. So. Thank you. They do have those um, facilities <clears throat> there, Rudd. Marcus. Yeah, okay, I, and um, I thank you for those clarifications on that, Rick. I also would just like to hearken to the special uh, council session had uh, with the city a couple weeks ago um, that was in discussion about this. And I just want to, you know, I, I heard Rick saying that he, he is not aware of uh, any discussions of use of that courtyard other than I do remember that Rick, when he told the city council what the uses were going to be, was specifically that the, at that time, uh, would, would preclude any other uses like uh, safe parking or another uh, a, another shelter provider operating within that. But one of the things that concerned me most about what Rick said then, and I'm just saying this now because I think this is the time we should talk about this, is the th that Rick had kind of he you, you were and correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, um, but you had you had said that uh, we needed to bring the fences. 10 feet inside the property line or so, so that hangers on outside the fence could be trespassed. My concern with that is in Bellingham with limited shelter, as we have to be trespassed from a mission property can be a death sentence. And so I just thought I would really like, maybe we don't want to do so much trespassing of people who are you know, outside. So uh, I understand there can be problems, but I, do, I also want to acknowledge that we, we need to not be trespassing people so indiscriminately from the largest, only funded, you know, the only embraced, heavily bra embraced uh, sheltering in, in Bellingham. I know there's other groups here and we all have to fight for our own, uh, but the mission is definitely um, where we're putting our eggs. So thank you. So um, let, let's, uh, let's look back to the rest of that conversation. Uh, folks who are trespassed or folks who can't follow the rules, what are the rules? Um, don't be a risk to other folks, right? Don't cause physical harm, right? If somebody, other than that, they're very low barrier rules. So quite frankly, if someone's there and putting a risk or causing physical harm, I'm sure you agree, it's probably a good idea that they don't remain there. So we're not trespassing people because they're not participating in the, the program. Um, it allows them to deal with those folks who can't follow the simplest of rules in terms of being able to be um, uh, to work together. And your own organization, Homes Now, would do similar for some a resident who couldn't follow those simple rules. 
Of, of, of course it wouldn't. I do agree with that. The, the, the problem that I'm having, of course, is the, 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 it seemed like it was being proffered as an ability to, you know, push them aside even, even more. And I, I'm just, a, I'm, I'm really concerned about that. There's a, there's, there are hundreds of people in, in Bellingham who consider themselves to be banned for life from the mission, whether or not they are, they consider themselves to. And so there's no there's no change in that discussion once it happens. That's the problem. And the mission could speak to this more specifically, but no one is banned for life. Um, they have a board that includes residents who meet every uh, week to allow for readmission. Their last resort is to bar someone. And again, the rules are fairly simple. If you're a risk to yourself or to others, if there's a, a, a potential for harm, it's not a good place for anyone. And that is a challenge. Um, a fair question to say is, if you can't go to this facility because you can't follow those rules, what facility do you go to? That's a fair question. Okay, thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, thanks for all your great questions, everyone. Uh, I think we'll move on to, since winter is coming, uh, we need to start talking about our severe weather and our winter shelter needs uh, for this upcoming winter. I don't know who wants to speak to this. I would ask Ann Beck, do you, uh, you handled this last year. Maybe you could uh, kick the discussion off. You know, um, so as Ann went over, we've got all this, this funding we're trying to sort out right now. And that's kind of been our priorities to get it out the door and get it spent. It's got a deadline. Much of the CARES funding has that October 31st deadline. And I had the realization a little while ago that the funding will be spent out October 31st and I can take a sigh of relief and then remember that November 1st is usually when we start our severe weather season. So um, it's it's just back to back. Um, I, we are, it's, it's in our um, purview to start working on it. I think we want to get all of our contracts in place right now with all the folks who are going to be helping get this rental assistance money out. And then it'll be a matter of trying to do some assessment of what our shelter numbers were last year. I have all that data and up from tracking it daily. Um, looking at the new capacity at um, the Lighthouse Missions uh, space, as well as possible other shelters that have applied for funding um, through this RFP we're going to put out and see if they would add capacity as well and see if there's going to be such a need for um, the, the added capacity of the shelter space. So that's all to say that we're thinking about it. The actions right now aren't super intense because we're trying to focus on this other piece, but it's definitely something that that we're working on. I will say, um, and this is Ann Deacon, but the good news for us is that we have uh, policies and procedures in place for severe weather shelters, uh, thanks to a committee that met last year, and we have willing partners if it comes to that. I think the question will be, um, will they still be willing given the COVID challenges? And if so, how can the health department help as you recall, we set up these severe weather shelters as a public health response to um, the dangers of being unsheltered in severe weather. So we will certainly work with any provider willing to offer the service to make sure they can provide the safest conditions possible. Okay, so it sounds like there'll be more on that later, which yeah. uh, brings me back to the upcoming meeting schedule piece on our agenda. Um, I'd like to propose that we meet on the second Friday of the month uh, at this time slot, 1030 to noon, uh, starting on uh, August 14th. Now, August is a, is a busy month for people's vacation schedules. I myself personally will be here. I would like to not miss an August meeting. I think we have a lot of work to do before this winter. Um, so I would like to start uh, meeting on the 14th. 1030 to noon, and then thereafter on the second Friday of the month. So what's everybody think of that? Marcus? I guess I would rather be, uh, uh, it seems like we've got a lot to catch up with right now. I thought I about that, and I think, I think I would tend to agree with you, maybe, maybe later. Uh, I, I just don't know that we have the capacity right now to do that. I think there's so much going on that uh, at least in August and September, I would prefer to stay with the once a month and then we can look at that in September and see if we need to up our schedule. Ann? I have a standing um, conflict that I couldn't make it. Um, if Ann Beck can 
attend on behalf of the health department, then we'll be able to give our voice. What What's your, uh, is it all Fridays or is it just that second Friday? Always the second Friday between 1030 and noon. <laughs> Okay, because I I'm not married to the second Friday. I just I just threw that out because today is actually the third Friday, so I believe. Yeah, that, it's only the second Friday where I have a standing meeting that really is critical to our behavioral health services in the. Community. Yeah, I think it's critical to have you both both the ands on our on our meeting. So I would I would say I would move that to the third Friday. Uh, if nobody has an objection to that. Does that sound good? Agreed. Okay, that's what we'll do. We'll start that, then that'll be uh, August 21st would be our next meeting. Um, we are at public comment. Uh, I don't know, we have 34 participants. I imagine there's someone out there in the public. Kathy Halka, can you just give a, a real quick explanation of how people can raise their hand or be acknowledged to, to uh, give public testimony? Sure. Um, we currently have two attendees with raised hands, and in order to raise your hand uh, to be recognized to speak during public comment, you can um, dial star nine on your phone, or if you're joining by computer, there should be a little hand icon on your screen, and you can just click <clears throat> on that hand icon, um, and it will show a blue hand. Um, if you would like, I can go ahead and call um, the people with raised hands. It's uh, Doug Gustafson and Tina Hayes. Yeah, go ahead. We'll start with Doug. These are uh, three minute uh, comment, please. Uh, uh, do you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Hey, this is Doug, chairman of Homes Now, Not Later. First of all, I just wanted to update the work group uh, that Unity Village and our tiny home community in Fairhaven are doing very well. Nobody's sick and we've been able to maintain stable operations. The village is largely self-governing and it's running very well. I also wanted to let all of you know that we're starting to see new applicants on our website, a little different than, nor than the normal crowd. We're seeing more and more applicants that have recently become homeless because they lost their job or got evicted after COVID hit uh, in March. Uh, policies that should be implemented immediately in the best interest of health, public safety, and environmental impacts. Some publicly sanctioned encampment sites. Uh, let Homes Now set up the first one uh, to use as a template. Unity Village is a proof of concept and an experiment. We've proven that the experiment works, therefore it should be replicated and increased. The City Council should move right away to change BMC 20.15.050. The section is titled Frequency and Duration of Temporary Safe Parking Areas, Temporary Tent Encampments, and Temporary Tiny Home Encampments. Currently under Section C, there is a time limit of two years for a temporary shelter. This should be increased to five years. Um, considering the new realities um, as and as budgets dry up eventually. Um, I just wanted to remind the mayor that I wrote a letter about this. The relevant part of my letter to the mayor titled April 7th is, I think the economic damage from this virus is going to cause a lot more people to become homeless. And our model is low cost, easy to set up and able to be set up quickly. And also for great for quarantine. Um, it, we're willing to be bold. The community needs a few victories right now, and I think that we're, what we're doing will be needed more than ever as this continues to play out, as the aid runs out, as the economy worsens with more evictions and unemployment. Um, I wrote this letter because we were asked to withdraw our application for Clean Green Site as a condition for accepting our extension at our current site. I wrote the letter in the hopes that we could just do more on uh, with more sites. They ultimately turned us down, but we're still trying. Uh, we plan to contact the county about some sites. We're hoping the county can identify some possible sites. Uh, we just need the electric hookups and the water and uh, hookups, and then we'll be able to take care of the rest. Um, we're ready to go, uh, eager to make a difference. All we need is the land to put the site on. Um, we, we're already doing it. We just like to do more of it and help more people. This plan does not interfere with any other sheltering options or existing plans. It just provides a boost while swimming against this strong tide. Homes Now is only one organization of many, and it all adds up. Please consider letting us help more people. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, go ahead and call the next person, Kathy. Our next speaker is Tina Hayes, and after... Go ahead, Tina. Is that better? Okay. I have been dealing with the Opportunity Council for over a year. I've been at Unity Village since August of last year. They have told me that they have housing for me, 
but both places that they've offered are worse than where I'm living. I'm trying really hard to find housing that's going to work for me. And now they're wanting me to move back to Dorothy Place, where I've always already been. It's a danger to my recovery, my health, and my better means of living. There's drug dealing there. There's abuse. There's neglect. There's domestic violence. The list goes on. My other answer they gave me was to live in a motel room. And how is either of those items better than where I'm living right now that is providing housing, stability, meals, cleanliness, um, new beginnings in my life? And now they're asking me to step backwards to where I've already been. And I'm not bettering my life by any of those. Having a case manager again, having to deal with things I've already been up against. I'm a counselor basically here with the people to help them stay on task, which everyone here is on task, doing well, no COVID, no people being contacted by police, no hospital visits, no mental breakdowns. Homes now works, guys. I have 18 people here that are succeeding more than they were when they were on the street. We have many applications of people that want in here. We don't have the units to put them in. But I see that our program of works, the people are prospering. They're moving forward. They're getting jobs. They're going back to school. They're getting cars. They're being part of their families again. How is that wrong? This program is working for many people here. And I'm pulling that our city helps these people that have been in this program for so long. I've been chronically homeless for years. And I've found that Homes Now has been the only thing that has helped me pull out of this. Like I said, I've been here a year. They put me in Dorothy Place for a year and I was falling on my face. Now that I'm here, I'm moving forward. I'm moving in my life on my every aspect of moving forward. But they want me to go backwards and go back to Orca Motel and live with a hot plate and drug dealers all around me. Or they want me to go to Dorothy Place where they let my domestic violence offender in without a background check. They put me in dangerous situations with people that were suicidal and or trying to kill themselves or others, including their own children. Some of these places that people think are safe for people are definitely not. They're not looking at the whole pictures of all these places. And I know for a fact they're having a hard time keeping people employed at Dorothy Place because they're afraid of the tenants that live there. I want to know what we're supposed to be doing as people here at Homes Now trying to get housing when there's none out there. I am on a fixed income of Social Security. And I'm not seeing my life going forward for housing because they put me there for a year. The landlord raises the rent. And where am I again? Right back on the street. Time. Time and time again. I'm needing your help to keep us on task as homeless to give us the options to better our lives, to get out of these situations. Stop putting us in places like Mission, Drop Center, Dorothy Place, Lydia Place. They don't work. I've proven it. For over 20 years, I've been proving it. Time, Tina. I'm sorry, thank you for your time. No, thank you for joining us this morning. Our next, our next uh, member of the public is uh, Dina Jensen. Hi, Dina. Hi, Barry. Can you hear me, everybody? We got you. Okay, great. I just wanted to make a brief comment um, just regarding the information um, that was remarked on by Ann Beck uh, regarding winter shelters. Um, I just wanted to express a concern over whether or not you, you all will be only looking at data from last year regarding capacities, kind of comparing that to what you want to do for this year because I, my own impression is that last year was, you know, very disappointing in terms of all the work that was put into providing 
you know, coming up with providers for shelter um, and hopeful at that time, you know, that it would be really inclusive of a lot of different kinds of people. And then it ended up to be a situation where those shelters were utilized to a very small degree and it didn't really seem I would not have thought it was for lack of people needing the shelter because Mission was turning people away just as one source of the possibility that people were needing shelter besides the fact that I would assume there are quite a number of people who are homeless in Whatcom County who would be needing shelter during the winter. So I, my concern is and my hope is that you not only would look at data from last year regarding capacity, but that you would also look as an example of what kinds of uh, attendance at the county shelter the year before were shown, you know, what, what kind of numbers that you all had there when you did, you had a dedicated place for a dedicated period of time that people knew was there, was well advertised, people knew they could show up there and was largely pretty successful in attracting people where the city shelter that year had failed because it was much more sporadic and extremely brief, like just a few days. But to me, you all need some kind of setup like that so that people know it's there and they know it's gonna, you know, it's going to be accessible when it's cold and not so severely cold as the parameters were last year. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Dina. Any anyone else, Kathy? There are no other hands raised at this time. Okay, we'll close the public comment. Uh, turn it back to the group. We I want to be respectful of your time. We got about a minute left. Does anybody have any last uh, thoughts they want to? give us. I thank you all for your dedicated work on our group. It's uh, you all are amazing. Um, I will see you on August 21st at 1030. And we are adjourned. The recording has stopped.